Now, I'm joined by the not-so-veteran national talk host from the United States Radio, the wonderful Jane Silk. Hi, Jane. Thanks for coming on the show. Hey, George. How are you doing? I'm well, and the Thanks better, for having me. The for, better having me. for hearing from you. Now, you're someone who's worked both sides of the Atlantic, so you know a thing or two about the special relationship, which in recent years, as I always say, has been a bit like the special relationship between Miss Lewinsky and President Clinton. Oh, uh, George. You could only get away with that on British radio, not on American uh, radio. <laughs> no. Uh, no, that's one. See, George, the difference, that's why I love radio so much. In radio, as you know, we don't have a script. And we could pretty much say anything as long as we don't say profanity. So, unlike well, television, where well, you're held to a little bit higher standard. Well, we've just been discussing the extent to which commercial radio is put to far greater tests of regulation than the British Broadcasting Corporation. But that's an internal British matter. Let me ask you about the transatlantic telephone call that took place in the last 48 hours between the pro-war Gordon Brown and the anti-war marcher Barack Obama. What did they talk about? Well, um, I believe that any differences they might have had before that phone call, for instance, when on the campaign trail before Obama surged in the primaries, Gordon Brown actually snubbed Obama. And they did put that to rest, especially in June, when it looked like Obama would definitely uh, carry the nomination. Uh, and I believe it was a very cordial, according to press here, and both on your side as well, uh, from the Telegraph and the Guardian, it was a very cordial conversation. Apparently, uh, Gordon Brown will make and will be the first European leader to come to America next month to meet with Obama. And Obama's first trip overseas, which he will not make until the G20 summit in April, will be his first trip to London. Um, so the special relationship still alive and kicking then? Um, special, I guess we'll have to wait and see how special, but I believe right now, uh, President Obama understands because regardless of whether you voted for him or not, just like over there, whether you voted for him, Gordon Brown or not. Nobody got the chance to vote for him, Jane. Well, that's true. That's true. Well, they will, have, they, they will have a chance soon. They will have a chance soon. But we in America, you know, had an incredibly flawless election as well as a flawless uh, inauguration. It should be an example for the rest of the world. Right now, he's our president. So we have to support him, but we can differ from him. The main crux of that conversation, President Obama wants Gordon Brown and the British uh, Ministry of Defense to support 4,000 troops. Britain right now only has about 1,700 troops they could spare to lead a surge in Afghanistan. Well, we've lost a very great... ...employment and poverty and lack of education opportunity and lack of health care. Oh, no, 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 what? Who, the military? Yeah, well, Jane, we've all seen Fahrenheit 9-11 here. We saw the recruiting sergeants. Oh, please, come on. You know, Fahrenheit 9-11, okay, I know the people who put on Fahrenheit 9-11, but come on, George, you know as well as I do, so many films, even documentaries, do take a little license and sometimes do embellish the truth. Well, w no, there's no embellishing. We saw them. We, they were filmed, the recruiting sergeants, patrolling the malls and parking lots of the down they, market. They have recruiting offices, George. They have recruiting offices, yes, in well, malls why, why and there in so many why, why are there so many black and Latinos in your army then? You're ready, right? to fight. You're ready to fight to the last drop of the every black and Latino George, soldier's gotta, blood. No, George, but you've got to understand something. Let's take, let's, let's take that comment that you said about uneducated folks. I, I, I highly disagree with you, but let's, for instance, say that we have a higher percentage of minorities, and Latinos right now are the biggest minority in this country, and they have surpassed the African American. But let's just say, for argument's sake, George, that those, some of, some, of the military aren't as educated as others, cannot go to candidate school or West Point to become officers right away. Let me tell you, the military is not such a bad thing. You you have a pay, you get a, a very decent pay, very decent 
benefits, but you also get an education. And then so you come back some... dead. Then you come back without legs. Not, not George, no. I, I know, I, I have interviewed and know a lot of military who say that's some of the best experience they've ever had. Some of them say if it hadn't been for the military, it would have never put them on the right track. Of course, Others... you couldn't interview the dead ones, Jane, and there have been thousands of those, and I'm, I'm telling George, you, and you, you need to know this. If you join the military, if that is your vocation, if you join the military, and that is what you seek in your life, well, is to defend your country, then you are willing to lay down your life for your country. Well, so you can't make excuses. Well, Jane, let me Nobody tell you. Nobody holds a gun to their head and say, join the military. Yeah, they do it under their own free will. Well, let me tell you something, Jane, that you need to know for okay. your work on the national radio networks in the United States. Okay. The British soldiers did not join the British Army in order to fight the United States as wars. And I'm telling you that the great majority of British people think we've already shed enough blood in Afghanistan, thanks very much, fighting George Bush's wars, and we're not going to fight them any more enthusiastically because Barack Obama's the president. Excuse me, though, George. If, uh, let me just say one thing. First of all, uh, you know, having lived in Britain and in the Middle East and all over Europe. I have, been in, I have been in terrorist attacks. I have been in countries where there were coups. I lived in Israel during the 73 war. I was filming then in a film. So I know what it's like to take cover. But that, that war, the terrorist war that is going on right now, we, before, before there were the jihadists that stepped up their, uh, their hatred against not only America, but the, but the Western allies, including Britain, because let's face it, George, Britain and America have been allies a long time, not just on this war, but other Jane, wars as Jane, well. Jane, so, Jane, Jane, when, there Jane. There was plenty of blood shed in Britain. What about the subway attacks? Jane, there were no Afghans involved in the subway attacks, and there are no Afghans have ever attacked America. Don't you understand that? But where, what about the Taliban? What's the last time an Afghan committed any act of terrorism well, I don't in know. the have United stopped, States. Have we, have we stopped every member of Al-Qaeda? Do we know Al every member of Al-Qaeda hails Al from? Or, or the Islamic jihadists? Al or any, any you see, Muslim? one of the problems with this monomaniacal a neocon approach of yours is that you conflate every Muslim, every 1.6 billion Muslims into one. No, You're I do not. talking about the Absolutely. Taliban. The Please. Taliban are an Afghan group who never attacked anyone outside of Afghanistan. Never. Not on any occasion, ever. George, first of all, I don't equate every Muslim. I didn't say equate, I said conflict. Well, I, I do. First of all, it's just it's just like I don't I don't look at every every Muslim or every jihadist emblematic of what every Muslim is going to do. I lived among Arabs and Jews in the Middle East. I have friends on both sides, and I don't I don't look at a Muslim. And here in this country, I have friends who are Muslim. I don't look at them and think, "Ooh, are they going to wake up one day and be a terrorist?" No, I don't. But. What I don't like is somebody trying to force their ideology down my throat but and Jane, say, if you don't like Jane, it, I'm going to blow you up. Jane, when was the last Afghan who ever tried to force anything down your throat? It's you who invaded Afghanistan, not them that invaded you. you know, Jane, George, Jane do you know this? There were, because you obviously don't, so let me spell it out to you. There was not a single Afghan on any of the planes that struck the United States on 9-11. There was not a single Afghan on any subway or any bus in the horrific atrocities on 7-7. No Afghan has ever attacked you. It's you who's attacking George, them. George, guilt by association. The, uh, the Taliban has guarded al-Qaeda and has and has protected al qaeda and other terrorist muslims for a very very long time who started al qaeda jane do you know that you you you've already told us that you were around in 1973 so i infer i hope not ungallantly that you are done certain as in which case you'll know very well that the people who created al qaeda osama bin laden and the rest were your government and mine in the late 1970s and the 1980s. The special, you mean with the special relationship that our government has with... No, no, I mean the arming and funding 
of the jihadists, as you would have it, in the war against the Afghan government from the late 1970s through to their triumph, which was hailed by both governments at the time. Ronald Reagan invited into the White House the very people who became Al-Qaeda. And Margaret Thatcher did the same on the platform of the Conservative Party conference in Blackpool. Or don't you know these things? Yes. Yes, but... That's enough, I think. We've had enough of Jane Silk. Not so smooth.